clients in pajamas. Dun dun. All right, you guys. So, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about something called homeostasis. Let's go ahead and write that on the board. Homeo stasis. So homeostasis is actually super important. It's what allows life to live, among other things, of course. But it is super duper 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 important. Life can only exist within very, very strict conditions. And homeostasis is maintaining those conditions. So maintaining a stable, balanced environment inside our body and not just within our body but within our individual cells even single celled organisms have to maintain homeostasis so for example temperature is a big thing we have to control we are endotherms meaning that we can regulate our own body temperature this is also known as being a warm-blooded creature other organisms like lizards are ectotherms. They rely on their environment to maintain their own body temperature. So like a lizard, when its body temperature drops too low, it'll go lay out in the sun on a nice hot rock. When its body temperature gets too high, it'll go back into the shade so it can cool down. I don't need to do that as much. I mean, I might choose to for my comfort's sake, but I don't need to. My internal body my internal systems will actually regulate temperature for me. If I get too hot, I sweat and it cools me down. If I get too cold, I shiver and it warms me up. We'll talk more about that in another video. Um, right now, we just kind of want to talk about homeostasis and why it's important. We said we can exist and survive because of this really, really strict set of conditions. I'm still kind of working off temperature. We're not going to talk exactly about how it is we maintain our temperature homeostasis, but we're going to talk about why. Proteins and other macromolecules are very temperature sensitive. So if they drop or if temperature or heat, I should say, is energy. And if it gets too cold in our body, then the energy is lost, meaning that energy isn't provided to molecules and they can't move around as quickly. So we can't maintain our systems if we're not getting enough mo molecular um, resources to them and everything just kind of shuts down. But on the other hand, if we get too hot, it is fatal as well. Your proteins in your cells cannot tolerate a high temperature your DNA will start to break apart and be non-functional at a high temperature. This is why sometimes it's really, really important and really scary if you have a fever. Now what a fever is, it's your body reacting to a foreign invader and it's actually trying to raise your internal body temperature to kill the bacteria or virus because again, Things are heat sensitive. However, if your fever gets too high, they will run you to the hospital and you will be put in like a tub of ice. They will put pack ice around you, whether you're in bed and they just throw ice packs all on top of you or what. They want to try and control that temperature because if it gets to a certain point, if your fever gets too high, your proteins all throughout your body can start falling apart. Your DNA can start falling apart. And essentially, it will fry your brain. So you will die from a high fever. That's why it's really important to kind of monitor and why parents get worried when their kids have a fever. Now, even if it's like 101, 102, 103, it's worrisome, but that's usually not fatal unless it stays that high for extended periods of time, like a week. But if it starts jumping up 104, 105, 106, 107, that's when you need to get your butt to the ER. Be like, I have a fever of this. Someone do something. Because again, if it gets too high, you will die from it. 
because our cells, our molecules cannot handle that much heat. They can't handle that much thermal energy. So our bodies, our individual cells maintain that very, very delicate balance all on their own. We don't even have to think about it. We don't. That's a nice, wonderful thing about it. It maintains its own internal temperature, internal pH, sodium concentration, water concentration. It maintains all that. And if any of those get out of whack, it lets us know that something is wrong. So either one, it'll fix it itself, or two, it'll let us know something is wrong and homeostasis will be disrupted. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, in our next video, we will be talking about positive and feedback loops in homeostasis and how that works with um, some of our systems. I do want to provide one example though of homeostasis and that's glucose. As we've been saying in quite a few videos at this point, our body needs glucose. Glucose is found in our diets. It is a carbohydrate. It's a simple carbohydrate. And the reason why we need it is because it helps power our cells. Within every single cell in your body, it will take in glucose and oxygen gas. Those will be sent to the mitochondria. The mitochondria will break their bonds, releasing energy. It will take that energy, store it in ATP in order to power every single thing in your cells. And then it will get rid of the waste products that are, were made as a result, carbon dioxide and excess water. So we see that this is a very delicate balance. We need glucose. There's just no getting around that fact. Now you can have too much or too little glucose in your body. And we'll start off with too much. So what happens? You have, so we have glucose, which is C6H12O6. That's glucose. If the levels of it, if you eat a lot of food and it has a lot of glucose that you're able to get out of it, so the levels rise. You increase the amount. There's a lot of glucose in your blood and your cells just don't need all of that right then and there. What happens is you have receptors that actually detect this high amount. So the receptors in your cells and in your bloodstream send a message too much glucose do something about it and that message goes to your pancreas so the pancreas is going to so pancreas will release something called insulin The insulin travels through the blood to your liver. And once at the liver, the insulin is actually going to stimulate cell, liver cells to absorb it. So insulin stimulates liver cells. And that's going to cause the cells to absorb and store the glucose. Now, they don't just store it as regular glucose. What the cells are going to do is they're going to form these long branching glucose chains. So this macromolecule of long branching glucose chains is called glycogen. So it's going to store it as glycogen. So to summarize, the glucose levels in your blood increase. Receptors recognize this and send a message to the pancreas to release insulin. The insulin travels through your blood and stimulates the liver cells. 
This causes the liver cells to absorb the extra glucose out of the blood, build it into a larger molecule called glycogen, and store it for later use. So then you have plenty of it later, and your blood levels are back to normal. Now you might think that insulin sounds familiar. It's, that's because it does. It's what people with diabetes need to take. They take insulin shots. And the reason for that is because for whatever reason, their body isn't making insulin. Either it's not making enough or it's not making it at all. So because now someone with diabetes, if they don't regulate their blood sugar on their own, if they don't keep track and administer insulin as needed, the pancreas, like we said, they're, they're not able to make the insulin. So the insulin never stimulates the liver cells to absorb and store the glu glucose as glycogen, which means their blood sugar levels rise and rise and rise, and it can actually be fatal for them. See what happens? You don't maintain homeostasis, you die. That's the thing about the science of life. At the end of life is death. But that's why insulin is important, because it allows the liver cells to absorb the extra glucose and to store it. All right, well, what happens if you don't have enough glucose in your blood? So the glucose levels decrease. They've gone down. They've dropped. You have too little of it in your blood. Well, once again, the receptors, they don't just detect if there's too much. They can also tell if there is too little, if the glucose levels dropped in the blood. And what they will do is, once again, they're going to send a message to the pancreas. This time, the pancreas is going to release a particular, that's not very easy to see, is it? I apologize for that. So the pancreas releases a chemical called glucagon. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly. I've only ever seen it written. I can spell it though. So glucagon. So it releases this particular molecule called glucagon. And what that's going to do, it's going to go into the bloodstream, it's going to circulate until it gets to the liver, at which case the glucagon stimulates the liver cells. Now in this case, and remember, the insulin stimulates the liver cells to absorb the glucose. Glycogon has the opposite effect. When it stimulates the liver cells, it causes the liver cells to... So the cells are going to break down the glycogen and release the glucose to the blood. <clears throat> so when your, your glucose levels in your blood, when your blood sugar levels get too low, receptors will detect that. The pancreas is going to receive that sim signal from the receptors and it's going to cause it to release something called glucagon. This is going to then flow through the blood until it gets to the liver where it's going to stimulate the liver cells. Now the liver cells are going to be told, break down the glycogen that you stored. So any stored glycogen, they're going to break it down. And they're going to break it down back into glucose. Then they're going to release the glucose to the blood and this is going to cause the um blood levels of glucose to increase, to get up to that, once again, balancing point. So in all cases, you're starting at normal. With this case, when you have too much in your blood, 
your levels get too high and your body responds by sending this series of sim signals to cause the levels to go back down. Here, the levels have decreased. Your body goes through a bunch of signals in order to take steps to increase the levels. Uh, let's see. All right. And we can also talk about disrupting. Now, we just mentioned what happens if the levels are off. Well, your body tries to fix it. And that's what homeostasis does. However, there can be cases where homeostasis is actually disrupted in your cells. So they're not doing the fixing part as well as they should. And there can be a wide variety of reasons for that. One could be because maybe the sensors aren't detecting the change. So for instance, we're with this example, we were talking about diabetes. And again, there's a, different factors that can lead to diabetes, whether it's the cells not being able to create the insulin or maybe not create enough of it or maybe the sensors aren't working so it even if the pancreas is very capable of creating insulin if the pancreas never receives that signal that the glucose levels are too high if it if those receptors are not working they will not send the signal to the pancreas which means the pancreas will not release the insulin it could also be that the sensors are working and they're sending a signal, but they're sending the wrong signal. There are cases where nerve cells send the wrong signal, where if I touch this, it's a piece of cloth, it should be relatively soft. But what if it felt hot? What if this board felt furry? Now we can both look at these and be like, yeah, that's not right. But it's the interpretation because the wrong signals are being sent. Um, homeostasis can also be disrupted if you go through a serious injury. So if you're in a car accident and there's damage to different organs or tissues, that can affect their ability to send signals, to send certain kinds of signals, or to receive signals. So that serious injury can actually affect your organs ability to regulate these things also disease causing agents like the flu virus that will definitely disrupt homeostasis that's why when you get sick you feel like crap it's because your entire homeostatic system is out of whack due to the presence of the flu virus um you notice when you get the flu virus you're shivering as if you're cold, but you're sweating like you're hot and you just don't feel well. Your muscles ache. Maybe you have a cough and headache and you just feel woozy and nauseous. That's all because your body is trying to maintain homeostasis, but the flu is affecting it. That The presence of those viruses are affecting it. So it's take care of the virus first and then maintain homeostasis. Get rid of what's affecting our ability to maintain homeostasis. So since our body is focused on getting rid of the virus, everything else is out of whack. So we take care of this and then we go back and maintain homeostasis. Um, but yeah, so I hope this was informative about homeostasis. I hope you guys learned some pretty interesting things. We will have one more video coming up about negative and positive feedback loops. All right, you guys. Um, stay safe, stay awesome, and just be amazing. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.